Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's program, which is part of our Equity in Education speaker series here at Bernard Zell. My name is Gary Weisterman, and I am Bernard Zell's incredibly proud head of school. I see we have people with us from all across the country this evening, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to our school, even if tonight is only virtual. On behalf of our entire faculty, staff, administration, and the Board of Trustees, I look forward to that time where we can invite you onto our campus to continue this work in the future, in person, in good cheer, and in good health. If this is the first time you're attending one of our community events, I would like to introduce you to our school, which since 1946 has been a pillar here in the Chicago community. Bernard Zell is an N8 pluralistic Jewish day school dedicated to preparing young people to become creative and critical thinkers who have a love of learning and who have the confidence to listen, question, and consider different perspectives. Knowledgeable, compassionate, and proud human beings who embrace a, diver a diverse and inclusive community are guided by Jewish values and are inspired to forge their own Jewish identities. Resilient, resourceful, and kind individuals who are prepared to advocate for themselves, support others, and act as upstanders. Active leaders in their chosen communities who make significant contributions to our world and who inspire others to do the same. And extraordinarily well-prepared alumni able to foster meaningful relationships and ready to live lives of fulfillment and purpose. As we near our 75th anniversary as a school, as we redouble our commitment to the values that make us who we are, we find ourselves at an important time in history, even as it bends in its long arc for justice. Like most of us, the events of the past year or so have reminded us that it is more important than ever to clearly articulate and live our Jewish values, including our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. We've been aided in this realization by our remarkable alumni who passionately share their own profound experiences. And for that, as for many other reasons, we are eternally grateful to them. Renewing our commitment to these values has meant making a strong positive commitment to fighting against racism and inequality and to educating ourselves about how best to achieve a better, fairer world. This school year, while managing in-person learning during a pandemic, our faculty and staff have also engaged in regular training in multiple domains regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion. We've held workshops for our busy community of parents, grandparents, and alumni. We've had two seed cohorts, a parent and a faculty one. And the fact that they're filled to capacity, I think speaks volumes about how truly thirsty we all were for this kind of work. We're proud of the work we've done and are continuing to do in this area. And we remain committed to always pursuing compassion, justice, and ethical living. I know tonight's program with Dr. Satter will prove both fascinating and informative. And I know as well that it will prove meaningful and thought provoking for all of us. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce Joanna Thompson, sixth grade teacher extraordinaire, as well as our diversity, equity, and inclusion coordinator. Joanna? Hi, thanks. Thanks, Gary. Good evening, everyone. This is so exciting. Again, we have so many folks, almost 190 registered for tonight. An incredible turnout again from our BZ community, but also from folks across Chicagoland as far away as California, Georgia. I want to give a shout out to the sixth grade students who have been learning about housing discrimination. And um, they are going to add tonight to their, their knowledge of down payments and mortgages, redlining, contract buying, to hopefully make a claim um, about housing discrimination in Chicago. Finally, a very special welcome to all of our friends and neighbors um, here tonight who live in the North Lawndale neighborhood. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. A couple of quick logistics for the evening. At the conclusion of Dr. Satter's presentation, there'll be a time for Q&A. Should you have a question that you would like asked um, at, the end of your, at the end of our evening, you can put that into the Q&A. There's a little button at the bottom of your screen that says Q slash A. You can put it in there. And some staff members from the school are coordinating all those questions, and we'll ask those questions for you at the end, time permitting. I'm thrilled to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Beryl Satter. I first became aware of Dr. Satter's book about eight years ago. And as I began to read, I realized that my family's housing story was one that I had largely found common amongst other white people I'd known was not universal. My story did not resonate for many Americans of color. 
Their housing stories were windows for me into a world of home ownership that I had never experienced. Perhaps tonight will be a window for you as well. You may also be on this call tonight as one of the many for whom these predatory housing policies resonate. I want to take a moment to recognize and honor the folks, especially those from the west and south sides of Chicago, here tonight for whom this narrative might very um, much be a mirror of home ownership in your family story. And um, all those for whom there's daily experiencing, they are daily experiencing the legacy of the choices made in the past and today. Dr. Satter's research has been foundational for the history of housing policy in the 20th century in, you, in the United States. Um, after her book, Family Properties, Race, Real Estate, and the Exploitation of Black America, Black Urban America, um, was originally published in 2009, she won the Organization of the American Historian's Liberty Legacy Award for Best Book in Civil Rights History. And it also won the Jewish Book Council's National Book Award in History. The book was a finalist for the J. Anthony Lucas Book Prize and for the Ron Ridenour Book Prize, awarded to, quote, those that persevere in acts of truth-telling. In her professional work at Rutgers University, Dr. Satter is a co-founder with Darnell Moore and Christina Strasberger of the Queer Newark Oral History Project. And for her current book project, A History of Late 20th Century Efforts to Reinvest in Black Communities, she won a Guggenheim Memorial Fellowship in 2015 and was selected as an Andrew Carnegie Fellow in 2016. The 10th anniversary edition of Family Properties will be released in May of this year and will include a 10-page epilogue providing research and connections to discriminatory housing policies that we still see today. Folks, we are in for a treat tonight. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Beryl Satter. Thank you. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, and uh, welcome everyone, a special welcome to uh, the sixth graders here. Um, I uh, remember being a sixth grader and I remember really appreciating when people talk to me like, a, like an adult, you know, like an equal, um, because, you know, I was old enough and I think you all are, and that is how I am going to address you. Um, so uh, if there's anything people don't understand, um, I guess you could ask them the questions. I, I hear you've gotten a great background from um, Joanna Thompson, um, but um, I'm gonna just speak to you as I would to any adult about this history um, that as um, Joanna Thompson just said, um, is one that many uh, white Americans know very little about um, and many African-Americans are all too familiar with. So. Um, I'm going to share my screen and uh, sh show you some slides and tell you um, this story. Okay, so on. Okay, so I hope everyone can see. Um, so I, um, my book, Family Properties, is actually. Um, kind of a personal book in part. It's about my own father, um, whose name was Mark J. Satter. And um, the book, I wrote the book, um, a lot of it had to do with curiosity about my father. That was what my initial impetus was because uh, my father died when I was six years old, um, which is very young to lose a parent. And, um, and I didn't know that much about him growing up. Um, but I had heard that he had been some kind of activist, that he had helped African Americans, um, and that I should be proud of him, but I wasn't so clear on what he did. Um, so it was a typical kind of like, well, maybe when you're older, <laughs> you know, you'll 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 find out. So um, part part of the reason um, that my um, family, uh, my mother's relatives, in any case, didn't talk about my father very much uh, after his death was because he had not left us with money, and um, we were left pretty much um, to depend on uh, Jewish social services, uh, social security payments, things like that, because my father died uh, with basically um, next to no savings. Um, I later found out that was because he took clients, whether they could pay him or not, and some other reasons connected to property. So, but uh, growing up, I didn't know. Um, I didn't know what he was known for, and I didn't know 
um, why if he was so well known, we had so little uh, financially. So it was a bit of a mystery. And I set out to find out what it all meant and who this man was um, once I, um, as an adult, when I, by not coincidence, became a historian, uh, learned the skills I would need to dig into my own family's past and then began to do so. So I start with this slide here. It's my father, Mark Satter, and his brother, Charlie, around 1920. And I want you to see this, you know, it's not because they're two cute little kids. It's because of how they're dressed. Um, if you take a look, my father is the older, the bigger of these two children. And he's wearing like a sort of a one suit, one, a bodysuit thing and, and little boots. And basically, he's a working class kid. And this is not how elite kids dress. Um, my father was um, from a family, the middle child in a family of six. He was the child of Jewish immigrants um, living in what was then a Jewish immigrant ghetto uh, in Lawndale. And in the 20s, as when my father was growing up in Lawndale, it was known as it was known as a Jewish ghetto. The term was used, and it was the second most overcrowded neighborhood in the city of Chicago. The first most overcrowded neighborhood in the city of Chicago was the Black Belt, which was the South Side part of Chicago that was overwhelmingly African American. So, um, so Jews came in a close second at that point in terms of overcrowding. And anyway, so I showed this to show that my father um, was born into an immigrant family, um, a working class family, and then he came of age. He was born in 1916. And um, in his uh, teenage years and early 20s was in the, during the Great Depression. And if being from a working class background wasn't enough to give him a critical perspective, the Great Depression was. Because the Great Depression um, was a period in the 1930s when the economy, both in the United States and in many ways globally collapsed. And a lot of people looking around said, wow, um, Capitalism might not work so well, you know, because we thought we were doing everything right and the whole economy has shut down, kind of like today, for very different reasons. And it's not our fault if we're poor now because nobody has work, nobody has jobs. So my father came of age in the Depression, and this image is of my father in the 30s. And he looks like the typical um, 1930s young radical. Um, I mean, he was, again, just a teenager at this point. But there's a sort of a anger at injustice that came, you know, at this point, somewhat from a Jewish heritage, but a lot from the economic conditions in which he came of age. Because in his own family, my grandfather was a laborer. Then he was make, uh, selling trunks. And then the depression came and it destroyed his ability to earn a living. And he ended up having to work for some relative. But the point is that for young people coming of age in the 30s, they were like, this system doesn't work too well. What's going on? There was also a sense that um, class mattered, that where you fit in the totem pole mattered. And in, and in my father's case, it was that it mattered much more than any supposed racial, racial divide between people. So here's my father in the 30s as a teenager. And here he is in the 50s as a columnist for the Chicago Defender, which is an African-American newspaper. And you can see he doesn't look that different. You know, he's still out there saying something has to give. So, um, and that he's going to fight uh, and if, um, for the working man. Now, my father became an attorney um, in the um, uh, late 30s. And he went to DePaul, which was a Catholic school to get his law degree. At that point, it was, um, they didn't uh, accept Jews in many law schools, but the Catholic law, the Catholic law school did. So he went to DePaul um, and got his degree uh, and uh, got his degree as a lawyer in 1939, which is the year he married. Also, of course, the year that World War II began. Um, the uh, call, the um, caption says, attorney Mark Satter, whose column All That Money Can Buy begins Monday in the Daily Defender. It says the column is devoted to the problems of the working man. And that was a sense of it's, again, it's not about, it's about class. It's about people who struggle, people who want to get by, who do the best they can, but, but are thwarted. And that's something he was interested in. Um, again, based on his background as someone from the working class himself. 
Um, now, this picture is of Albert and Sally Bolton, who were um, the same age as my father, um, also got married in 1939, as did my father and mother. Um, they were um, clients of my father's, and it was his experience with them that set him on the trajectory um, to understand the way that African Americans in Chicago were being exploited by um, real estate brokers and bankers um, that would then become his, his life passion. Um, now, Albert and Sally Bolton were, um, it, they were uh, grown up in Chicago. Um, they, uh, again, married in 1939. They lived in the South Side. Um, and the South Side, um, what they called the Black Belt, was a sort of a small area where African Americans were allowed to live. Um, if they tried to move outside the, of, of that area, there was a lot of white violence to keep them in bombings, harassments of all sort, and the fact that um, banks would not lend to them to move out of the Black Belt. But Sally and Albert um, wanted to move out of the Black Belt. Um, and they had four children by the late, they were married in 39. By 1957, when this picture is taken, they had four kids. They were still living in a tiny little apartment over a furniture repair store, and they wanted out. So what happened is they came to my father as um, as clients, and they said, "Look, you know, we we heard about you somewhere that you're an attorney that you know can deal with some real estate issues. We have a real estate issue." And he said, "Well, what's going on?" And they said, "Well, we bought a house, uh, and we were making payments, but we missed a payment, and now we're getting evicted." And they said, "Can you do something to slow down this eviction? Because we are." We think we could come up with the money if you just give us a little time. We just need time. So he said, well, tell me about the house, you know, that you bought. And they said, you know, they gave him the address. And he said, well, and it was in Hyde Park, actually, which was then um, mostly white. Now it's somewhat integrated. Um, so they had moved out of an all-Black South State neighborhood into a mostly white one. And he went to, uh, he looked up the um, records on the house. And he said, well, by the way, would you guys pay for this house? And they said $14,000. And just to get a sense of what that meant, in 1957, you could buy a brand new house in the suburbs for $5,000. So this is a very old property in the city. It's like triple what a house should cost. And my father said, well, wow, you paid a lot of money for that place. Uh, you know, you know, let me look it up. And he, so we went to the um, property records in City Hall across the street from where he worked in downtown Chicago. And what he did was he looked up the address and he found out a few things about this property that Albert and Sally had purchased. Um, first thing he found out was that uh, it was very old and not in great condition and should not have been sold for $14,000. But that's the first thing. The second thing he found out was that the guy who said he was Albert and Sally's real estate broker, his name was Jay Garan, that Jay Garan had, was actually the owner of this property and that Jay Garan had, had sold them a property that he himself owned, which you're not supposed to do. You're supposed to like be clear that you're either a broker or the owner. He said he was a broker hid and he hid the fact that he was an owner. Um, the third thing was that Jay Garan, when he sold, had bought the property that he sold to the Boltons, just about a, three weeks before he sold it to them. And the fourth thing is that when he bought that property, he paid about $4,000 for it. And he turned around three weeks later and sold it to Albert and Sally, who you see here, for almost four times what he paid, 14000 so it was insane. Like you don't do that, you know. That's such an incredible markup of price, and that wasn't even the worst of it. Um, the worst of it is something that um, you all heard from uh, Joanna Thompson, which was that he sold them this property on contract, which basically means he sold it on an installment plan. Most people get a you know borrow money from the bank to buy a property, but uh, once they have it, they it's theirs and it's very hard to throw them out. And 
they have to fall behind on a lot of payments. And then there's a whole complicated legal situation. And then you still get every bit of monthly payment you made, you, you get to keep, you know, if you buy with a bank mortgage, but they don't buy that way. They bought on installment, just like buying a car or something on installment where you put money down and then you make monthly payments until it's over. And um, the problem with the way they bought this buying on installment was that um, if they missed, according to the installment rules, if they missed one payment, they would lose the house, just one. That's a problem when you pay almost four times what a house is worth. You're much more likely to miss a payment if you're paying way too much. So that's what happened to them. Um, they bought in a risky way. They bought from a guy who already owned it, but didn't tell them. They bought at a massive markup and they bought um, you know, in a way that if they missed one payment, they would be out. So they were in a very perilous situation. And the big question is, why would they do that? Why would the Boltons buy a property so expensive and on installment, which gave them no protections if they missed a payment? So the answer to that is something I think you've been learning about in class, which is redlining. Um, this is um, basically, uh, this is the city of Chicago, 1939 map um, from, uh, homeowners Loan Corporation, which was an, a, a um, um, city, uh, I'm sorry, a, a federal agency. Um, the places marked in red are where, are where they will refuse to make bank loans. And they also were the places where black people lived. Um, and the idea was that, um, well, first of all, black people were trapped into the oldest parts of the city, which were the closest to downtown. You could see downtown here. So the areas, you know, the immediate neck, immediately close to downtown were old and then newer out areas were built further and further out you went. Um, red was where they will not loan, yellow is where they'll loan a little, and blue and green was where they'll give plenty of bank loans. And um, black people were pushed into these older decaying parts of the city. Again, white violence, white people would mob or attack them if they moved to these other areas and banks were not loaned to them if they wanted to move to these other areas. So they're stuck in the red area. And if you're stuck there and you wanna get out, um, you know, there wasn't too many good ways to do it. Um, if a bank won't give you money to buy a house, almost everybody buys a house by getting a loan. They don't pay the whole $500,000 or whatever it might be now. They pay 10% of that, maybe 20, and they borrow the rest. But if you can't borrow the rest, what are you gonna do? So. This is the context for why Albert and Sally couldn't, had to buy the way they did. Um, black Chicagoans could not get mortgages. And those of you, if there are people present who live in Longdale to this day, you can see this headline from 1960 saying, Lawndale Credit Squeeze, wanted mortgages, meeting tonight to air the problem. Um, and uh, in the dark letters, it says, um, Middle-class Negroes are as good credit risks or better than their white counter counterparts, but they still can't get mortgages. So it didn't matter if you were middle-class, it didn't matter how, you know, that you had a good job for the last 20 years, you could not get a mortgage if you lived in one of those redlined areas. This is another newspaper uh, clipping from 1962. It says, call, call Negroes good home loan risks. But Illinois federal SNL has tough requirements, and SNL is a bank. So it's saying this, this headline from the Chicago Daily News, which is, um, was a mainstream newspaper at the time, says that even though Black people are perfectly credit worthy, they cannot get mortgages, they cannot get loans. What if they want to move to the suburbs? In the suburbs, you can buy a new house for $5,000 uh, as opposed to a very old house for $15,000. Um, and if you were a vet, you could get a house in the suburbs for literally no money down. So why aren't black people moving to the suburbs? Suburbs are keeping them out. This is a newspaper account from the Chicago Defender. It says, um, 1962, the Chicago wall. It says, predict suburbs to open next five years. So this, this, that newspaper article is basically saying, well, we all know we can't move there now, but maybe by the late 60s, we'll be able to Maybe. So what all this means is that they're trapped in the city. Doesn't matter, again, how good their mortgage, their credit rating is or how long they've been at their job, they cannot get a loan to get out of their overcrowded neighborhoods where they've been hedged in for a long time. Um, 
African Americans, the African American population in Chicago in 1940 was about 280,000 people, and they were confined to the South Side, to this one area in the South Side. By 1960, there were over 800,000. Well, by late 50s, there were 800,000 Black people in Chicago, and by uh, early 60s, there was a million. And there's a million people, and they're still crammed into this small area on the South Side. And banks won't let them out, and white people won't let them out. So if they want to get out, there's only one way to go. And that was through the Articles of Agreement, which is basically an installment contract. Articles of Agreement for Warranty Deed. This is the kind of contract that the that the um, Bolton signed. It was a contract that looked like a mortgage, had a lot of fine print. Um, you still put a money, you still put money down just like you would for a regular bank mortgage. You made all your, um, you paid interest, you paid insurance, uh, you were responsible for all the maintenance on your home. But it says down here in little, little letters, um, in the case of the failure to make any of the payments or any part thereof, you lose your house, it says. And that's not how it works with a regular mortgage. So my father went to the Boltons and he said, you know, this is what happened. You, this guy who, sold, who, who, who said he was just a real estate broker, his name was Jay Garan, he actually sold you a house that he owned. He marked up the price almost four times what it should have been. And he sold it to you on an installment contract where, you, where he has the right to throw you out if you miss one payment. And the Boltons said, this is outrageous. We didn't know it was that bad. We want you to fight him. So my father, um, did a court, took, went, took Jay Garant to court and he said, you know, you took advantage of these clients, these people, Albert and Sally Bolton. You said you were selling them a property, but you hid that it was your own property. When you say you're a real estate broker or, and oh, they said, we, the, when the Boltons bought the property, they said, we, um, we want, you know, it looks good, but it's a little expensive. We just want to talk to an attorney. And Jay Grant had said to them, no, 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 you don't need an attorney. I'll be your attorney. So what my father said in this case is that you can't claim to be someone's attorney when secretly you're working for yourself. That's actually illegal. You have to um, work for your client. He said he, Jay Grant, thwarted that rule. He ripped these people off and he should not um, get a chance to throw them out. He, that the whole contract should be made void stopped. Well, he did not win that case. The judge said that the Boltons signed an agreement and they're bound by it, the end. And the Boltons lost their home and lost the down payment and lost all the money they put into it to date. And it was a big blow for them. But for my father, this is an article from the Chicago Defender, again, a black newspaper from of Chicago in um, 1958. He said, you know, you know, he was very distraught over losing this case for the Boltons, but he decided he had to publicize what was going on. So this is one of the first articles in which he publicizes what's happening. It says, lawyer reveals unethical actions in property sales by Mark Satter. And he says, the penalty to the Negro people for, in real, for real estate injustice is $1 million a day. He says, this is the ruthless and wicked speculators tax that they have to pay, he said, is the tax they pay for the privilege of being Negro. Today, some people call that the color tax, the race tax. It means extra money that you're charged because you can be. Um, it's extra money that Black people pay for housing, often for insurance, um, for overpriced groceries in their neighborhoods, all kinds of things that because they're segregated uh, and, um, and discriminated against, they are forced to pay more. So my father said, look, this is happening. We have to stop it. And then he goes on to explain exactly what happened to the Boltons in this article. Um, he says, with a ready supply of cash, the speculator who I prefer to call the exploiter buys a property at about 4,000. That's what Jay Graham paid. He then sells it to a Negro purchaser for 14,000. It's exactly the Bolton case, you know? Um, and he says, we have to stop this. It's gonna destroy it's going to destroy. Oops, sorry, um, the 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 um, city if we let it go on. Now the reason it would destroy the city is because if you are paying four times what you're supposed to for your property, and if you can't miss one payment uh, without losing that property, you will do anything to hold on to that property. So what you do is 
you can't make repairs on it because you can't afford it because you might miss a payment and lose it. You uh, might um, subdivide your place and overcrowd it, so it's overcrowd it so that you could rent out part of it to make that payment. If you're working and um, if, if one adult in the work family is working and the other one's raising the kids say, you might say, well, we have to both work because otherwise we'll miss the payment because you're paying so much more. So in every, you know, there's all kinds of ways that my father put it, the, the, the contract selling, uh, when it's exploitative in this way, it makes, it forces the person who bought that way to be their own exploiter. Like they have to drain themselves. They have to work extra hard, subdivide their apartment, neglect their apartment, maybe even neglect their kids because they have to keep working to support this property or they're all on the street. So if, a, if, if lots of properties are being sold on contract in one neighborhood, you end up with a situation where many properties at once, suddenly no one's painting them, suddenly no one's repairing them. Suddenly, instead of one family per property, there's two or even three. Suddenly the kids are on the street. Suddenly the schools are overcrowded. You know, uh, Suddenly there seem to be no adults around. And this is what happened when black people moved into a neighborhood where the properties were being sold on contract. And the white people who are in the neighborhoods looked at them and said, what's wrong with them? Like, why are they, why don't they keep their property up? You know, and they don't know that they don't keep the property up because they're paying four times, three times double what you're, what the white people are paying. They're saying, why don't they look after their kids? They don't realize that they have to hold multiple jobs just to hold on to that property, you know? Um, and with double the number of people in a neighborhood that the, that the neighborhood is made for, when that happens and garbage collection stays the same, garbage starts to pile up. In Chicago, uh, the school board was quite racist. They would not let black kids in these overcrowded neighborhoods go to nearby white schools that were empty. So the schools become overcrowded. And the parents aren't there and the neighborhood starts to, to go downhill. And the few white people who are left say, I'm getting out of here. You know, because these people are coming in here, they, you know, even if you were a well meaning person, you know, even if you had nothing against African Americans, you know, previously, they move in, the neighborhood seems to be going to hell, you're out of there. You know, they don't know why, they don't understand the deeper mechanism that's causing the chaos that they observe. So, this is a very tragic situation. Um, on top of that, you have a situation where um, real estate brokers are going door to door to white people in these changing neighborhoods, which was then what Lawndale was. It had been predominantly white and Jewish, at least in one part of it. And it was now becoming more and more African-American as more and more black people were buying on contract. And real estate brokers would ring the doorbell day and night of white people and say, you want to sell your place? You know, you should, because there's some black people moving in. And they'd be like, no, we don't want to sell. And the real estate broker might say, well, great, don't sell. But I'm just telling you, you paid 8,000 for your house, I'll offer you 7,500. But if you don't wanna sell, no problem. I'll come back in a week and I'll offer you 6,000. And if you still don't wanna sell, I'll come back in a month and I'll offer you five. In other words, I will keep cutting. Your place will be worth less and less the longer you wait. And the truth is, it was somewhat true because banks, as soon as black people moved to the neighborhood, stopped lending there and you couldn't sell anyway. So. If you were going to sell, you had to sell to a speculator, someone who was going to buy your house cheap, turn around and sell it on contract to a desperate black couple that couldn't buy anywhere else. So most white people in these neighborhoods, Jewish people, non-Jewish people, they would say, okay, fine, I'm selling. I don't want to leave, but I'm selling. I'm out of here. I'll take your cash. I'm going. I'll go to the suburbs. And so the neighborhood keeps changing. But in every case, there's somebody in the middle, a speculator who's buying from the white people who are leaving and then reselling the same property at double the cost or triple or quadruple to a black family. Um, this image I've had you look at it for way too long. It's about the kind of mass meetings that were happening to talk about this problem because people tend to think, oh, nobody knew what was going on. It was a big secret, but it wasn't actually a big secret. Um, you know, black people knew how they were forced to buy. Um, white people did not pay attention to it, but my father sort of brought it to their attention. And he kind of mediated between the black press, which talked about it quite a bit, and the white press that didn't talk about it at all. So this is um, a flyer from March 
1958, Fight for Your Property. Um, and it is um, two giant mass meetings to uh, answer your questions. And it has ministers from the West Side uh, and ministers from the South Side. These are mostly African-American churches uh, to answer about what is happening to our property. What are we paying? It says here, attorney Mark Satter expressed the exposed the conspiracy uh, between the underwriters and the bankers to deliver the property of Negroes into the hands of the exploiters. So this is uh, happening. This is my father addressing the Greater Lawndale Conservation Commission in 1958. This is an interesting photo because the man seated next to him, the white guy, is. Um, a contract seller, an exploitative contract seller. And after my father explained to this community group how contract selling was so made them so vulnerable and drained money from the community, that guy, the next guy next to him, stood up and said, Hey, it's free enterprise. You do what you want in free enterprise. You buy what you want and you sell what you want. And it's my right. But meanwhile, look at this um, group of people and look at their faces. And they don't look very happy as they're learning about. Uh, how ex how broad based this is. This is a contract seller, um, just to get a sense of who's doing the contract selling. It's um, longtime realtors who are, um, you know, happy to take advantage of people. I'm just showing you some images. Here's another uh, Lou Wolf and Albert Land, later indicted for slum uh, arson, indicted slum art, 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 operators in arson. So these guys, after they sold on contract over and over, eventually uh, just burned the houses down for the sake of um, money, uh, insurance money. This is a 1962 article. Uh, again, the black press was covering this stuff, the white press less so. Um, it says, law backs housing racket, contract buyers at mercy of Sharpies. And it's basically about how, um, it, you know, it's explaining how these contract sellers are taking advantage of African Americans in Chicago, um, and giving some examples from some of my father's cases. Um, so uh, it says here, stirred by these activities for many years, has been Attorney Mark Satter, who contends that Negroes throw a million dollars a day down the drain because they can't resist the lure of housing speculators and unscrupulous landlords. He was starting to get frustrated because he wasn't able to stop these people through lawsuits. The million dollars a day cost of being black, a major headline in 1962, again in a black newspaper. And it just shows that people knew that the money was being drained from the community. They just didn't know how to stop it. And it's not easy to stop. Um, this is an example of um, how, um, how much money was being made by these sales. In the, the dark, part of this map is the South Side Black Belt in 1940. It's again, sort of a narrow strip of land where black people live and white people who lived in the rest of this. And if any black person moved out, they would be met with a lot of violence. Um, and then eventually uh, the banks would just, um, they would redline also not allow them to move out, not get them lost. So, um, this is when it, when the Chicago Black population was about 280,000 people. Look at the size of this. This is by 1960 when there's about a million Black people in Chicago. So again, compare this. It's a big change. And in every, every little parcel of land that's as the Black population is spreading in the South and West Side, they're pretty much all being sold on contract. They're pretty much all being sold for double or triple uh, what they're worth. And they're pretty much all being sold in this way, where if a Black family misses one payment, they lose their home. White people had nothing comparable to this. This is a quote from 1959 from a middle-class Black homeowner. He said, face it, racial prejudice is profitable in Chicago. Every time a new parcel of land is added to the bronze ghetto, millions of dollars in real estate profits are made. And the point here is that, you know, this was not a mystery. Uh, people knew what was going on, and they did what they could to um, publicize it, but that didn't mean that it stopped. Um, there were powerful interests um, who wanted to keep it going, because when you have millions of dollars in real estate profits being made, everyone who's making a profit wants to keep it going. And I can talk about how that worked in the Q&A. 
Um, my father died of a heart ailment in 1965. And that was when I was six years old and he was 49. And it was from overwork and other things. It was mainly though, because he had had a, um, a heart ailment. He, he was born with a problem with his heart and he had it his whole life and eventually killed him. And the year after he died, Martin Luther King came to Chicago. And this is Martin Luther King on the West Side in 1966. And he tried to mobilize uh, poor people. And his idea was that he would um, work with the renters and because um, he thought they were the poorest. In fact, it was contract sellers who were the ones struggling the most. Um, and um, he moved to the West Side uh, in order to publicize things. And the West Side landlords, knowing that he was famous, cleaned up his apartment so that they wouldn't be called slumlords. It wasn't really very effective. But other people moved to the South Side, I'm sorry, the West Side in the um, late 60s after King left. And this is, um, there's a quote that was put up um, on the screen before, uh, when you were coming in. It was from ta Coates. And he said this, that my book is a lot about, about Blacks and Jews. But I want to say the book is very much about Catholics as well. Blacks, Jews, Catholics, all the different people who live in Chicago. And Catholics play a big role in the book. And um, in 68, they were radical priests. One of them was this man, Jack Egan. And he was sent to the West Side where there, there were few Catholics um, as a punishment for being too much of a activist. But once he got out there, he started organizing people. As did this man, um, Jack McNamara, who died recently, here sent to help organize people, working with um, local black organizer, Henrietta Bank, who um, was someone who had brought on contract, realized she paid too much and decided she was gonna speak out and talk to people about the problem um, and get people to sort of admit that they had been taken advantage of. By the late sixties, black uh, home buyers in, in Lawndale and the West Side and in the South Side, they had been struggling for years to make their payments and they were tired and they wanted, you know, they, they were just sick of it. And they were struggling and the neighborhood was declining and they didn't understand, you know, why should it be so expensive? Why should it be so hard? And when they started talking to each other, they, they realized the problem was that they had all bought in this exploitative way. And they realized they had to come together and challenge the people who sold them those properties and get them to pay them um, to renegotiate the properties, to lower the price so that they wouldn't be overpaying every single month, month after month. Um, so these are some other black activists who got involved in fighting exploitative contract sales, Clyde Ross and Lucille Johnson, Sidney Clark, these are all people I write about in my book. This man was a Chicago policeman who ended up <laughs> being arrested for um, fighting for his property, um, for saying, uh, I will not pay my monthly payment uh, until everyone in my community gets their contract and renegotiated. So that's what happened. These um, African-American people on the West Side and the South Side, with the help of organizers, some Catholic, some Jewish, some white, some not white, um, they got together, they, they decided, they, they told their stories to each other. They found out how much they had overpaid. They found out how vulnerable they had been through no fault of their own. And they decided to organize and fight back. So they went to um, people like Mo Foreman, the guy I showed you the picture of earlier, people like Albert Land and Lou Wolf, the guys who were later arrested for arson. These were speculators and contract sellers who owned you know, hundreds of properties each uh, that they had resold on contract. And these black activists picketed at their offices and said, you have to renegotiate these contracts. You have to lower the price. He, they said, you can make a fair profit, which we consider 15% profit, which today would be a great profit. They said, but you can't make 100% profit off of us. You have to renegotiate. And when, um, here's another activist, Ruth Wells. These are the main people that organized to fight back in the late 60s several years after my father had passed away. Um, and one of the ways they fought back was by saying, if you don't renegotiate the pro your, our, our, our properties, we're gonna stop making our payments. But, um, and, and we'll force you to renegotiate that way. But the problem is if you don't make your payments, it's within the rights of the seller to throw you out. So that's what happened. Uh, they began, um, black contract sellers said, we're not making the payments. And the 
the uh, real estate guys called in the police and said, throw these people out. They didn't make their payments. Their, their contract is void. And this is a picture from the south side of a um, eviction. Um, so it was pretty dramatic. It was happening in 1969, 70. Um, but the thing was that activists then turned around and said, you know, you can't throw them out. We're going to bring their furniture back in. This is um, a rabbi here, Rabbi Robert J. Marks. That's Jack Egan. These are um, local activists who said, you know, these many, most of these people are members of the Contract Buyers League who uh, refused to let themselves be evicted. Um, this is another picture of on the West Side, activists saying, you're not evicting us. We have the power of people behind us, and if you try, we're gonna, you know, a not let you into the apartment. B, if you get in, we're gonna move uh, and get move the furniture out. We're moving it right back in. So there were these heated battles in the streets of Chicago in 1969 and 70 over evictions, um, and you can see the look on these people's face, how happy they are when they say, "You're not coming here. We are standing together. We're gonna make you renegotiate these contracts." So ultimately, many uh, some contracts were negotiated, and this is an example of one group of home buyers renegotiating their contract, uh, getting a greatly reduced price, uh, and in return, um, you know, calling off their 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 protest. Um, and they were people are you know made saved you know tens of thousands of dollars by coming together to protest. Um, I think I will stop here, and. Um, because I'm talking too long. And we will go back to any questions you might have. Um, I know that was a little technical and I'm sorry. Um, it's a little awkward when you speak in this way because I can't see you and I can't hear you and I have no idea if you're looking bored. So um, but I just tried to walk you through the main points, but let's have questions. Let's open it up and um, I'm happy to answer anything you wanna ask. Um, any loose ends or anything you're confused by. Well, as those questions are coming in, I want to say thank you. Wow. Um, I, I, I know my phone was kind of blowing up over here. So <laughs> I feel like people were really, um, uh, there were, what you were saying was really resonating. Um, so thank you. Um, I want to, as these questions are still coming in and giving you a chance to breathe for a minute, for folks who do want to buy your book, I'm going to put a couple of links into the chat for y'all. Um, Dr. Satter has um, recommended a bookstore that she um, likes in Maywood. It is a black owned bookstore and I'm putting, it's called Afroware and you can call that bookstore and you can order a book from them. You can also find her book at semicolon and on Amazon and all of those good places. Um, uh, and um, I, I also want to say that this, your work, um, Ta-Nehisi Coates' work, Jack McNamara, and Bruce Orenstein, who um, has the documentary coming out, were mentioned in an NPR article. Um, like there was maybe in, it was 2019, but I'm going to put that in here too because it was right after a report also came out um, on this on this work too. So if anyone's interested in looking at that, um, so one question for you coming in: um, How do you see things being different? Um, or the same today. What what are you noticing today and um, and then? Um, well, uh, tragically, I think things are much more the same than different. Um, I made a big point of showing you newspaper clippings from 1958, 1960, 1962, 1964, where they're saying, "Look, look, we're being robbed." You know, um, here's how it's working. Look, you know, but um, despite that. Most people don't understand how this all works. It's a little bit complicated. It's like kind of a two-step process. You know, it's like first the banks don't loan and then someone else does loan, but in a really exploitative way, in a really dangerous way. So you have to kind of understand a little bit about, you know, how money works and how credit works and how mortgages work to understand how people are being ripped off, how African Americans are being ripped off. And so even though it's kind of known, uh, it remains unknown and therefore it keeps continuing. It keeps repeating itself. So what I think is happening right now is that there's a swing in um, the way that banks and financial institutions treat black communities. 
historically. They either don't lend at all or they lend on exploitative terms, which means they charge way too high interest. Uh, they make a loan that you're not likely to make to be able to pay because it's too expensive to borrow the money. Then you don't make the payment and then they grab your house. So it's either no loan or predatory loan or no loan or predatory loan. And unfortunately, what we have seen since 2008, when there was a massive global financial collapse caused by predatory lending, is that many Black communities in Chicago and elsewhere have been cut off of mortgage loans again for various reasons, which I can go into. So they won't lend. And so what happens? They're buying on contract again. It's like back you know, and it's again, draining wealth, you know, except this time, instead of some guy like Lou, Lou Wolf or Jay Garan or Mo Foreman, these like individuals, it's big private equity groups that are buying up massive numbers of foreclosed homes and then reselling them on contract in majority black and Latinx neighborhoods, not in white ones, because they're going in places where the banks have already set the ground, you know, for, desperation by not lending there. They're doing it again. And it's and it needs to stop. And we need stricter laws and people need to, you know, have some awareness of how this has worked so they can be stopped and remedied in some way. So are you going Do you to think that the uh, Yeah, in your book you know you you mentioned that there were those those contracts um, were sold to maybe um, doctors and physicians um, and lawyers that weren't part of this contract sale. It had nothing really to do with the real estate world, but were like a, a side, maybe like a, a professional side hustle, as it were, to make more money. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds a little bit like what that was in the 50s and 60s is a little bit like what you have of these bigger companies today. Is there a parallel right. there? Or am I yeah, I think, I think so, very much so. So, um, I mean, it happens over and over. Um, just to explain to the younger people, I hope this works. Um, if you buy a house for, um, say, ten thousand dollars, you know, uh, and you sell it for twenty thousand, you know, if you're con if you're a speculator, you buy from a white person for ten thousand, you sell to a black person for twenty, and you have a contract that that says, um, you know, I'm owed four hundred dollars a month until this thing's paid off, you know, the twenty thousand. Meanwhile, you know you only pay 10,000 for this house. So what you do is you sell that contract to some nice doctor or lawyer or dentist or business person who wants an investment where I pay, you know, that you sell to this new guy for 15,000. You bought it for 10,000. The black person owes you 20,000. You sell to some white intermediary, sometimes a black intermediary as well for 15,000. So you're still making a big profit and the new guys, so I only paid 15,000 for this house, but I'm getting 20,000 back. So both of these parties benefit a lot, but the person who's carrying it all is a black homeowner who's forced to pay this high money. So that happened then. The version now is that people who buy into a private equity company are getting the profits that this private equity firm is making by buying a foreclosed home or often like, you know, $5,000 and selling it to a black or sometimes it's also happening in immigrant and um, Latin, Latinx neighborhoods. They're selling a house they bought for 5,000 for like 30,000. Like the markets are even worse, like five times. It used to be double or quadruple. Now it's five times or even more. So they make this huge amount of money and everyone who contributed to that equity fund also makes some money, but somebody doesn't. And that's the people who are buying this house. And it's their communities that are getting drained and, and damaged. Wow. Um, so thank you. It's, it's one of those things that you, real, you realize that the money, it, it's marching through communities. And when it lands in your lap, you, if you aren't asking like, well, which communities did it march through before it got here? Like, that's a good question to ask. So Very um, good. some student questions coming in about, um, your father. So um, um, two questions about your father. After learning about your father and doing all this research, how did that change your image and your perspective on him? And um, how did your did your father get any pushback from members of the white community? Um, but because he was representing these black families? Yeah. 
Um, maybe I'll start with the second. He definitely got a, a lot of pushback. Um, he uh, was threatened. Um, I got, I have, I mean, I'm a really good historian. I know how to do research. And um, I ended up getting a note that was from the, he had written to a, a newspaper com, um, guy who, uh, a, a reporter, and he said, I'm being threatened. And they're saying, if I don't stop what I'm doing, they're going to get me, you know? And I have that letter where he says, this, they're threatening me. He did get um, beaten up. He, uh, people wouldn't talk to him uh, because the big thing he did was he called out other lawyers because it was lawyers, often lawyers were among the professionals that were buying these contracts for profit. You know, the intermediate, you were buying it from the speculators. And he said, listen, you're an attorney, you know, you're my fellow attorneys, we all know each other. You gotta stop buying this stuff and you gotta start talking against it. And they're like, you are thinking on a fellow attorney, we're throwing you out. I have a story of my aunt told me she, she had the same last name, Satter, and she went to get a job at one point in a law firm. And they said, Satter, they said, you related to Mark Satter? And she said, yeah, it's my brother-in-law. They said, goodbye, we're not hiring you. There's no way, you know? And they sent her on her way. So, you know, you know so the, the other thing was that if this was the 19, late 50s, early 60s, it was the height of anti-communism. And the Red Scare, not the hype, but a, it was happening. And my father was always talking about working people and equality among people. And that was seen as sort of like lefty commie kind of language. And a lot of attorneys didn't want anything to do with it. They don't want to be investigated by the FBI. As my father, in fact, was investigated by the FBI because he made those, he talked a language that was seen as radical and subversive. So he definitely paid a huge price. And on top of that, of course, he just took, any client who wanted his, who needed him, and a lot of times they couldn't pay, and a lot of times he lost the cases, and he was, his own financial situation got more and more precarious, and then he got sick and died, you know, and there's more to it, which I, I talk about in the book, and I'm not going to go into here, but, um, but, you know, he got caught up, you know, he, it, it, there's a cost to being a crusader, and one of the reasons I grew up without hearing about him much is because my mother's family felt that he let left her to pay the price of his conscience. That he died, I'm the youngest of five. So when he died, my mother was left with five children, you know, to take care of alone. She had a high school education, you know? And her family was like furious, you know? Like, how could he do this, you know? She was more loyal to him and said, you know, your father was a good man and, you know, we're gonna, you know, she would try to say, but there was tension in the family around who are you responsible to your family or your community? How do you define who's your community? Who do you, where do you draw the line of care? And I think we need to draw that line uh, much more broadly, obviously, or we become part of the problem. So um, that was the second question about the threats and he definitely suffered from that. Um, the first one was what, what did it feel like to find out about him more or less? Yeah, how did it, did it change your perspective about him? How did that change? You know, yeah, I mean, I learned First of all, that he had been a brilliant man and I learned so much from him and from Jack McNamara and from uh, Clyde Ross and all the different people that I learned from by studying this book. I mean, you know, researching the book. So I learned that he was, had been quite brilliant and quite um, pathbreaking. And I, as I was going through his papers and his speeches and things, all which had been saved at his death by my older brother, Paul Satter, who was 16 when my father died and who took it upon himself to save everything. Um, otherwise it would have all been gone. So, um, and when I was, you know, Paul finally showed me this stuff and I read it, I was like, oh my God, you know, like this is mind boggling what I'm reading, the speeches, the articles, you know, everything. Um, but uh, I also found out, you know, that he was a tough, tough character that he, people would say to me, I don't want to say anything bad about your, your dad, but he didn't suffer fools. And if he thought you were an idiot, he let you know in two minutes. And he, you know, he, he turned people off by being, you know, too quick with them, you know? So people would always apologize. They didn't want to tell me. And I was like, I said, I've heard it. You know, I know he was, you know, aggressive and intolerant with people he thought weren't able to grasp what was going on, which were, again, mainly his fellow white attorneys. So. That's what I found out, but I, I admire that, you know, um, and I think it was an important thing, you know, I mean, I learned about the full, the full person, not just a, a two-dimensional, but a three-dimensional version.
Wow, I just love that your big brother saved all of these papers, and he didn't even know that his little sister was going to be a historian. Um, oh. the, I, I am nowhere near the historian that you are, um, but I the, that warms all of the historian tendencies in me, for sure. Yeah. I, I also was really struck by the idea of who is your community, and at our school, we talk about that a lot. We use phrases like, who is in your universe of obligation? There are certainly like myriad Jewish values that we try to live up to. Um, that that would speak to that. And um, I was thinking as you were talking about the, the, the sacrifices your father made for this community that he saw was his too, and, and how it took a toll on his life. You also mentioned your book, how it took a toll on the client's lives, like the worry and the stress and how yeah. different different people dealt with it. They, some said, well, I can't do anything about it. I'm going to find joy where I can. And others like died young, you know, and very prematurely. And they died of heart ailments, the same from... thing. They died of heart ailments. Yeah. They died of overwork. They died of stress. The widows would say, my husband died because he worried every day about this house. And when he lost it in three weeks, he was dead. I mean, so yes. Go ahead. I just want to say, <laughs> brutal. No, I appreciate brutal. that. You, you, yes, yes, exactly. And and a lot of the students at, in class this week and um in the in the in the question and answer, they're they're wondering like what happened to those folks when if they lost their homes, you know. So I loved the you know we're gonna put the furniture right back in the house, but there were lots of times when that that wasn't what happened when that didn't work. So lo there's a lot of questions here about when what happened if they couldn't pay their bills and they where did they go. Mm -hmm. um, also, what, um, you know, were they able to negotiate their contracts and did they get their down payment? Did they ever get their down payments back? Did that, yeah. what well, was that, the financial restitution kind of a thing? Yeah, well, yeah, they, um, they it, it varied, you know, and there was a long, long drawn out court battle that lasted like a decade, you know, but a lot of, a good number of people uh, on the West side and South side settled with the sellers who did not want to go to court in the end and ended up getting their contracts renegotiated, i.e. lessened, you know, brought way down the prices they paid. And they saved tens of thousands of dollars. And some people say that the amount of money that, that was saved or, you know, recuperated through the contract, they were called the Contract Buyers League, that through that organization, of all the activist groups in the 60s, they were probably the ones that had the most direct financial, like, benefit from standing together. In some cases, you know, other people, some people lost their homes altogether, some did. But the thing is, when they stood together and they did a payment strike, which is what the Contracts Buyers League did, they were not paying for like a year or two. You know, they held their money back. So then by the time, if they got either, there were two outcomes, either they settled with the seller and they got the price reduced and it was good, or the seller refused to negotiate and it ultimately threw them out of their home. By then they had not paid any rent for two years. <laughs> and they said, we've saved enough money now, we could buy someplace else, you know? Um, and so um, that also happened. Um, that's because by the late sixties, it was possible finally to get mortgages. And so one of the questions was, and it's not a dumb question at all. If, blank, if banks had lent it to black people, if they give them mortgages, would this have happened? I don't think so, you know? I mean, they would have gotten mortgages if they were fairly priced, the same as white people did, but they also needed to be allowed to buy in the same areas that white people bought in, i.e. places where their homes were in good shape, likely to increase in value, things like that. So it mattered a lot not to get a mortgage. Um, but so there was different ways you could benefit. And one of the benefits is simply by being part of a social movement where people stand together and collectively, <laughs> collectively, you know, pressure and collectively get benefits. And that's what the Contract Buyers League did. That's, that's something, the by the way, that my father couldn't do. He was not a leader in that way. He was not a kind of political organizer. He didn't, he talked and he argued and he did legal cases, but he didn't bring people as a community together to talk to each other. He did a, not a tiny bit, some of his clients spoke, but he didn't do the kind of community organizing that happened in Lawndale, started in Lawndale, then spread to the South Side that ended up winning these people the benefits, the, the people who had bought on contract that they needed. Oh, well, he certainly found his lane and stuck with it. And um, I noticed I, in the, in the um, I think it was in the book that you mentioned that um, folks on the, on the West side were really good at organizing. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I, I think that that's still true today. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I would say that that's very true today. Um, what uh, Evan, who is a sixth grader, um, would like, Evan Lufrana would like to know, um, when did the courts start to rule in um, favor of getting rid of redlining? And I'll add to his question, how did that affect this contract buying when um, neighborhoods started to open up? Mm -hmm. Well, um, it's a really, really good question um, and a complicated one. Um, in 1968, which is three years after my father's death, um, and right around the time the contract buyers league were organizing, um, a law was passed, the Fair Housing Act. It was part of the Civil Rights Act of 1968. And it said that banks, that people had to be treated fairly by financial institutions and they shouldn't basically said they shouldn't redline. So the problem was to this day, the enforcement mechanisms on that law are extremely weak. You have to bring a case against the bank and as an individual, you have to say, I went to buy the, uh, you know, I have the same credit score as this white guy and they gave him a loan. They wouldn't give me a loan and my income is the same and everything's the same. So then you petition, you know, then you have to bring a case against, you know, against this lender as an individual, it's a really bad system because it leaves it up to the victim to fight the battle. So actually it hasn't ended. It keeps happening. It's not legal, but if you Google redlining banks, you will find basically every year, another article saying, oh my God, we, black people can't get loans. This bank has been found to not lend, to live, give all their money to white. They, they take deposits that black people put in banks and they lend it, that money out in only white neighborhoods at like a gross uh, imbalance, you know? So that all unfortunately still goes on. And if you notice in Chicago, it's still quite segregated. So it hasn't ended, you know? Um, and it's, uh, you know, People, banks use like what they call proxies for race. They don't say they're not lending in a black neighborhood. They say they're not lending in a zip code or in an area that's old or in an area that's close to downtown, you know, something downtown. I mean, they'll, they'll say so, anything but. And then it's up to the people to prove that actually you're not lending to us. So more or less, unfortunately, the case, it continues. That's why contract selling is continuing. That is powerful, the idea that in a community, uh, the banks will take your money, but they won't loan it back to you. Um, mm -hmm. I know that North Lawndale just got um, a bank. We haven't had a bank here in, I don't know, somebody who's on the call knows how many years it's been. But um, so that's, that's a big deal. Um, uh, we have a lot of questions, so I'm going to keep going. This is fantastic. Um, someone says, I love hearing about the historical Jewish-Black connections in Chicago. Thank you for sharing you, um, your father's uh, personal stories. What organizations and institutions and people are currently doing important work connecting Black and Jewish communities in Chicago that you might know of? Mm -hmm. um, definitely the Jewish Council on Urban Affairs, JCUA. Um, they were active then, they are still active today. And I think as far as I know, I mean, I'm sure there's others. Um, I know in New York, there's Jews for Racial and Economic Justice. Um, you know, uh, there's lots of different groups. In Detroit, uh, I know of a group that um, Detroit Jews for Justice. Um, you know, so in every city, it has they have their group. But in Chicago, the Jewish Council on Urban Affairs, which in the '60s, urban affairs meant meant black people. You know, now it doesn't mean that much so much anymore. But um, they've been involved uh, fighting to to make this kind of coalition for a long time. But I I do think it's important to note that, you know. Sometimes Jews and Blacks stand together and sometimes they stand apart, just like Catholics and Blacks and just like every other group, you know? So um, there were Jews who were among the contract sellers. Jay Grant was a Jewish guy, you know? And, and among in his defense was like, oh, he gives a lot of money to the synagogues, you know, he's a good guy, you know? And it created all this havoc and tension within the synagogues in Chicago when the Contract Buyers League started organizing because they had members who were contract sellers. And then they had other members saying, we can't, we can't work with this guy. You've got to make him stop, you know? And you had rabbis pressuring contract sellers and you had other people saying, leave him alone, he's a big donor. <laughs> and, you know, so, you know, these debates, you know, nobody has a, nobody has a monopoly on, on, on morality, unfortunately. I mean, fortunately, we're just all human, you know? And it's similar for Catholics. You had white Catholics who were bombing black 
families who were coming in, mobbing them, hurting them. You had other black activi uh, Catholic activists who were um, really putting themselves on the line to create better conditions for everyone and, and for integrated communities. So, you know, and there were also some African Americans who worked with contract sellers for, for good pay. So nobody's immune from corruption, financial corruption, but nobody, everyone is also, there's a possibility for, um, you know, learning and growth. And we all have to use our own traditions uh, to get there, you know, uh, because whether you're Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, Muslim, uh, Buddhist, you know, Hindu, we all have, elements in our traditions that can be used for justice and that we need to call on. That's beautiful. Do you, um, when you think of the historically Jews at that time, you know, the identity of being a Jew in America was changing. Um, what ways do you see that identity and, and it's changing? I mean, you also mentioned in the book that at one point, um, almost right at the at the at the at the beginning of of contract selling and things the the major organizations that were jewish in north london were moving to the suburbs like uh, uh it was the the jci i, I might have messed up my jewish name, people's say, institute but, but, thank you jpi thank you um and places that people would want their families to be going to and sending their kids to sunday school at those places that felt like the center of community were leaving so what what would you say that 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 fed into this as well well, you know, Jews, um, North Lawndale was, as I said, the second most overcrowded neighborhood in Chicago. <laughs> you know, it was seen as a rundown place in the 30s. And then came the war and everything kind of froze. And then as soon as the war was over, people left because it was a kind of a rundown urban neighborhood, you know, um, and it wasn't stylish. And if you had an option, you might want to go. You know, um, so and the Jewish institutions. Um, well, two things were happening. One was that it was an old, rundown neighborhood, and in my family history, I, I asked one of my uncles about it, and he said people would tell him, "You're crazy to still live there." You know, uh, they called it like Lower Slobovnia. They said it's like living in the outskirts of nowhere. Uh, it was a joke they used. Um, but um, but the other side of it was that Jews were assimilating more in the post-war years. Immigration had been cut off in the 1920s in this country. So you didn't have, you know, people, my father was from an immigrant family. His parents were immigrants. They came in in the teens, you know, but in the twenties, they stopped all immigration to the US, most of it. So you didn't have people coming in, new people. So by the late forties, it was like a generation that had grown up in the country, in this country, the old immigrants, immigrant, ways were associated with the grandparents, the old people. And if you were a young Jewish person in like 1950, you might not want to have your whole life centered around Jewish institutions. It might feel kind of old fashioned to you and you might want to just have a fresh start and be more of an American. So, I'm just, so that was another dynamic that was part of why they might want to leave Lawndale, leave the synagogues, leave the all the institutions that had helped make help Jews acclimate to the United States, because by the late 40s into the 50s, they're like, we're acclimated, we don't need this anymore. This is a cycle. Often it's the first group needs to love institutions, the children rebel and want to be American and their grandchildren get interested in what their grandparents had. So it's, it was that kind of thing. Not to mention, of course, World War II and the Holocaust and the, you know, ways that it, um, in some cases, sensitized some Jews more to the similarities between the vicious laws that the, the Nazis put out and our own American laws against African Americans, which were, you know, way too similar um, in terms of demon, you know, in terms of segregation and separation and denigration and exclusion. Um, we are, uh, we have about 15 minutes left, so I'm going to shift our conversation to like what, so, so, so where do, what should we do? <laughs> um, so two questions I'm going to kind of try to smush together. Um, we see these problems of, of 
not just housing, but segregation and the, and the, all of the, the trappings and the legacy of that for us, um, both locally and nationally. How do you recommend that we fight these predatory policies that are in existence? Um, the, un the unfair taxing of poor neighborhoods, the fact that, you know, things at Walgreens cost more expensive, and if that's your main grocery store, um, <laughs> um, or where housing is overvalued, um, um, or people are paying. So what do we do about that sort of like the, the, the color tax, the race tax, especially mm -hmm. if we're, you know, we're not tax, you know, experts or that's right. not our field. Right. Um, I'll start there and then I'll ask the second, what can we do question after that? Okay. Well, I think, you know, none of us are born experts, um, but some people really commit themselves to learning about particular situations, community organizations um, that like the contract fires league i mean they those people educated themselves like everyone said you know it's too complicated you can't do a social movement around an installment contract nobody knows what an installment contract even is nobody knows what bank redlining means this was in 1968 right but these middle-aged black home buyers contract buyers said you know what it matters to us and we could educate ourselves on this and we could educate others so they ended up really sort of making a new wave of knowledge about how these things worked in the city of Chicago. And Jews supported them in some cases, in some cases not, but you know, the battles in synagogues about this similar and similarly in, in churches. Um, and I think that's the same procedure today where, you know, the communities that are most effective, affected are also the most effective, <laughs> you know, they um, are, uh, you know, neighborhoods where disinvestment goes on they um you know they're deeply concerned they investigate you know and i would you know try to like get the lay of the land of of of, of activist groups um particularly in i mean in chicago it's pretty obvious which neighborhoods are being um left to you know to to, to decline and which ones are getting huge infusions of money you know, and many of these neighborhoods, I know um, the Northwest side, there's some Puerto Rican activists who are very um, clear on stopping gentrification um, and how to do it and how to protect their neighborhood. Um, on the, or there was several years ago when I spoke at one of the places there. Um, but I would look to see, uh, I would listen to the people who are, who are most directly affected. That's always the best way. And chances are they can educate you on what you need to know. Right now, an ex another example, there's a million, is um, you know, problems with lead in the water in the city of Newark where I teach. And there are, there's a Newark water collective of local people in Newark who are learning everything there is to know about lead in water. And you want to help, you could be living in part of the city where that's not a problem, but you might want to learn about what's going on because, you know, we all have lead pipes, you know, and uh, it might affect you later if it doesn't affect you now. So the basic, the gist of it, local community groups close to the problem, listen to what they have to say and support them. I love that. There's a saying, the people experiencing the problems are the people with the solutions. So just do, just help them do those things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I really love that. Um, uh, and I also just want to give a plug for the North Lawndale Homeowners Association and the North Lawndale Community Coordinating Council and the North Lawndale Greening Committee. There's a number. And in Inglewood, there's like Grow Greater Inglewood. There's all kinds of organizations that um, um, if you just start, literally start Googling, you will find the people um, who are you know, they are teachers and they are learning everything they can learn about whatever the problem is that they're experiencing. Mm -hmm. Um, One other interesting group is the Dearborn Realtist Association. Real estate used to be uh, entirely segregated, and the um, National Association of Real Estate Brokers was all white, and they uh, refused, you know, they told their people don't, don't sell to Blacks, you know. So Black real estate brokers had to form a separate group, and they called themselves Realtists, not Realtors, because they couldn't use the white label. To this day, there's a Dearborn Realtist group, and they're very smart, and they're very savvy, and they're very aware of um, the history of real estate speculation in the city, and they're another group you might want to watch out for. It's also um, an African-American woman. I, I can't remember her name right now, but for the first time, they have a Black woman heading the Chicago 
um, Real Estate uh, National Association of the Chicago Real Estate Board. Um, it's no longer segregated. And she is also um, getting that group to face its past and, you know, um, go forward uh, in a more equitable manner. Thank you. And thank you. I learned so much about real estate when reading your book and just, yes. So um, here's a question. What an amazing experience for you to personally research and write this book and get to know your father and the work that he devoted his life to. Thank you for sharing what you learned. Um, I wonder, this person asks, what role do you think our government leaders locally and nationally should be playing in putting a stop to these practices? So what, there's, what can we do, but what do we need to hold our elected officials um, accountable for? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an excellent question. Um, I mean, there's a lot they can do because these things are, you know, these are practices that are encoded in, these are institutional practices that are, you know, deeply embedded in these institutions. And I really think ultimately only new laws and policies will change them. And our elected officials can make those changes at a, you know, municipal level, and then ultimately maybe state and national. So um, you could um, hold them accountable for changing laws around installment land contracts to make them more equitable, to uh, make it harder to hide your ownership, to put in safeguards. I mean, there's all kinds of things like that. Um, there's, um, we have right now a, um, the Cook County um, Assessor's Office, the head of the Assessor's Office, um, it's Colgan, Colgley, I think it's the name, but we have an assessor in the city government who was trying to rectify uh, racist assessment practices. And that's a whole nother thing, but that's where black homeowners um, are um, overtaxed. And that's, oh. something, mm -hmm. and that's something else to hold our elected officials accountable for. How are they doing tax? How are they, um, who are they taxing and how are they taxing them? And how are they determining who pays what? It's often inequitable and it's a hidden way to extract another race tax. Um, another thing I think to hold officials accountable for, to really push for is, I um, mean, this is something I learned from the um, Dearborn Realtors and some other groups. Um, I learned from them way more than I teach, I think, but they were talking about, um, as was uh, Fritz Kogi at the assessor's office, that we need new forms of mm -hmm. school funding. You know, schools, schools right now are funded by individual property taxes. And so black neighborhoods, First of all, we, you know, we need to stop segregation. We need to stop redlining and all that. Um, and that can be something that laws can be passed to hold banks accountable. But um, we also need to change the way education is funded so it's equitable, so that you know all tax money is sort of equitably, equ equitably distributed to all uh, neighborhoods so that a neighborhood that's already depleted doesn't have to pay five times as much you know, for to, to support a school as a neighborhood that's full of wealthy institutions that can contribute to the tax base and then they get way better schools. So we have a system right now where, you know, the rich get richer, you know, and the poor get drained just to get the children educated. And it's, it's really grossly unjust. And it's the kind of thing I think that you can hold. But there's a million things that you could that you could organize to petition your elected officials to do. The main thing is that they get educated to know that these things are problems. And that's one of the great things that's happened with the assessor's office is that the, the current assessor knows this history, very well aware of it, and he's doing something. Yeah, that's an easy one. If no one knows about that recent, very recent, like right before Fritz Kage became the assessor, um, there was just quite a bit of a hullabaloo around how different neighborhoods were being, the properties were being assessed and how they were being taxed. So mm -hmm. definitely Google that. Okay, our last question comes from a student who says, I want to be a historian when I am older. Yay. Hey. Do you have any advice on how to do good investigative research? Uh, could I get, the, does the student want to say what, what their uh, interest is maybe? So I could give it more specific um, advice. But, you know, how to do it. You know, you got to be pretty dogged and you have to think about it like you're a detective. You know, you're a detective, you're turning up every clue, you know, no matter how remote, you know. So I like, I mean, the way I, you know, you need to track down people, but you need to track down archives and you need to be dogged about it, you know. And 
you need to get into the thrill of the chase. You know, if you're a good historian, there's nothing you love more than to go to an archive. And as soon as we're in an archive, that's where they hold the papers that people used to collect in the course of their lives to tell, you know, all the all the letters they wrote, all the minutes of their meetings, all the speeches they wrote, whatever. And they all go into an archive. And I've been in archives and you hear people go, oh, you know, like you hear people like, oh my God, you know, as they're reading because they find something incredible, you know? And you have to have that joy of the chase. You have to like, really want to know and enjoy piecing together you know a bit of the story and again i think if you think of yourself not as you know plodding through a lot of stuff but as like a detective really eager to learn something and really eager to find the clues then it, it becomes more fun you of course do have to do a lot of reading on your topic but i would always say both read on your topic and do the primary source research at the same time to enjoy it and i think being a historian is a lot it's being a historian and trying to find something out is a lot like learning a language when you're in the country where that language is spoken. You know, like if you try to learn French here, it's like, you know, you sit through the thing, you learn it, you try to memorize it. But if you go to a French speaking country, it's like, I got to know this, you know, and you learn much, much faster. It's very similar with doing historical research. When there's something driving you need to know, you sort of slurp in that knowledge, you know, and it kind of, you know, you're excited, you want to know it, and you follow those leads. So I would just say, let yourself love and care about what you want to know, like determine the thing that means the most to you to understand, and then enjoy the process of seeking that knowledge. That is wonderful. Well, we can definitely see that um, you had that driving question, you had that drive to, to learn here. So I, I thank you so much. I thank you um, to everyone who came. There's been some great um, uh, things put into the chat that hopefully the panelists were able to, or the um, the folks behind the scenes were able to send out to the group. Um, I want to say thank you to Beth Sandenbacher and Rebecca Bloom and Brian Barash and Abby Spalding who um, made is ma are making magic behind the scenes tonight. So thank you so much. Um, Beryl, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We are so grateful that um, you shared all of this with us. Um, there's lots of thank yous in the chat right now. And um, it was totally my pleasure. Uh, I really appreciate